So what happens is, is that you have this reality that's developed then in degrees. And I'm going to explain to you why they put the Jesus guy, even though it's on the unbalanced cross, on this cross, or as the original symbol shows a man in the pentagram strapped to the pentagram, or sometimes you'll see it in the Sumerian as a man uh, basically uh, stuck in the spokes of a wheel. Okay, this is the occult symbolism, and this is why the occult symbolism lends uh, volumes of knowledge for the one who is educated in understanding what it really means, but volumes of ignorance and foolishness for the one who takes the base or the gross interpretation of it, right? And I want everyone to think of this word today, the gross or dense interpretation of something versus the let's say, for instance, uh, uh, refined, okay? The refined or purified, right? We'll use that term today, okay? So the, gro the grosser, dense interpretation versus the refined and purified interpretation. So as we go into this, what you'll realize is, is that the cross symbolism has everything to do with human beings, not just a man on the cross, but human beings on this cross, right? And, or this wheel. And what this wheel is con consists of are the elements fire, water. Excuse me, we've got two waters going on here. This should be air. <laughs> excuse me. So fire, air, water, earth, okay? So what happens is, is that this becomes the explanation on why many people have a hard time changing because in each of these tents, and we'll put some numbers here really briefly, right? This is going by no particular laws, rules, structures, edicts, decrees, or whatever. We're just going to, we're using this all for, uh, excuse me, skip seven, all for um, metaphorical purposes in order to mark or designate, I miss five over here. <laughs> it's like, man, he, yeah, trust me, all this stuff to me now, it rolls into the number zero and my mind collapses it and then begins high spin. Because when you're dealing with this kind of rudimentary building block stuff, you move very slow like a block. It moves like a block in your brain uh, or, or square wheel, which doesn't rotate very well. OK, so what you're dealing with then here is that these are what I'll call and will designate today the degrees. OK, because we talked before about the degrees of the fire and why fire is always measured in degrees. But we've come to understand that air has its degrees. Earth has its degrees. And these degrees denote how far it is away from its dense or gross state versus its purified or refined state. OK, so. Every reincarnation and this is what is talked about, there's a, that there's a greater ancient and organic will that we're going through that seeks to refine and, and perfect us so that way we reach quintessence, which is basically the merging of all of our abilities to unlock within ourselves um, basically the, the straight pipeline of Kundalini or Chi, which brings us into a graduated state of consciousness. Until then, what you get is, is notice that on people's node chart, and we'll just draw a rudimentary node chart here, right? And then they show the, the astrological houses. Excuse me, I'm probably doing a hor horrible job. My stick men are still beautiful. But then you have the astrological signs, right? And then they say, oh, you have 30 degrees in the house of Aries and 90 degrees in the, in with Sagittarius, and then they draw you out this node chart, right? And what this node is based on is your degrees of creation. That's why it connects to how much light you give off. It's connected to why you have individuals that are extremely polarized or extremely airy, extremely fiery or extremely earthly or extremely watery because these are archetypes. Okay, do this right. Archetypes. 
to say it is this fire as we understand it, it transcends just the fire that you see when you light a, a, when you light a, a lighter. It transcends into a level of understanding the temperament, mainly the temperament. This is the key word, the temperament of the element. Like a fiery individual likes and dislikes certain things, just like an airy individual likes and dislikes certain things. So these, measure, these weights and measures of degrees equal the person. So what you're really trying to do, and this is why it's, it's also hidden within the symbol of the pyramid, but from the top, meaning that if you are seeing it when it's in front of you, it just looks like this. So thus, this is the system that you get stuck in, right? And this is about, as we know, the, the generation cycles, right? But when you see it from the top, everyone says X means stop. Right. It means that instead of the continuous combustion, which is hidden within many symbols, you can go one, two, three, four quintessence. See, there's a fifth point on top of the pyramid that designates how your energy. So how your energy is supposed to flow. So if this is your body, if you see yourself standing up, just like we saw the image of the cross being basically an image of the, a person. If this is your body, what you're seeking to do is come into the center of yourself. Okay? And to explain that a lot more clear, excuse me, explain it a lot more clear is that you can see yourself then as you have this spine and Kundalini needs to make it to the Kundalini needs to be activated. The only way for it to activate is for it to come through the center. So if you're five degrees of fire and two to three degrees of air and nine degrees of water and, and uh, uh, let's say six degrees of earth, this makes you a certain kind of person. And so if you're not doing alchemy on yourself, you can get lost in this world, this crucible, because that's what this symbol means. It means a crucible. It's a place where something, once it emancipates itself, will become a thousand times stronger. So this is when we get into later on of how the alchemy is being worked on us now. Like they are master alchemists that understand how to change the temperament of the people around the world based on utilizing the elements as sculpture for a sculpturing purpose. Because it's important, as me and Thomas were talking about, that you begin to realize that, first of all, then, how is this shaping and molding and refining even being done? What is the tool being used to do that? You have to go back to the simplicity of thought. If something is to be done, if something is to be molded and shaped and fashioned, then we surely would need a hammer or some kind of tool to do that with. So what is the tool? Fire, air, water, earth. The alchemist has these tools and can sculpt their own world. But we have alchemists that are choosing to sculpt everyone else's world by utilizing these principles to cause the change that, that, that will come about when they utilize those principles, meaning that this is how you create the future on earth. And that's one thing that we need to realize, that this knowledge here is the graduation of earth because it's once you bring yourself in a balance, bing, 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 then what happens is your body is now in balance. So the Kundalini begins to rise up the center. Then it goes up the spine and then it comes out of the top of the head. And then you, you eject from the environment, right? Okay, so I'm just checking the cameras here. Make it, let me check the sound. <laughs> Okay. All right. So the next thing here is, is that we started talking about the difference between the gross or the dense versus the refined and the purified. Okay. And the reason why is that when we're dealing with things like fire, because they say what brings you closer to this centering of yourself is to begin to refine yourself, right? So we wanted to understand what is over here because this is what the archons are. 
Okay? Right? Why? They are the shape or the molders or the refiners. Okay? Why? Because they are archetypes. Okay? And why? Because they are polarized. <laughs> right? So they've chose to hang out on nine degrees of fire. <laughs> no water at all. Real gross. Why? Because what happens is, is when an individual begins to think of only the gross or the dense interpretation of what they are, we only can see that within the elements, okay? And the, the elements and the minerals, because they have their own story. And we'll talk today, later on, about lead. But right now, we're going to talk about gold, okay? It's just as an example, and silver as an example, okay? So the person that is very gross or dense uses gold for only financial purposes on the physical dimension, or maybe even wears it as a jewelry, etc. right? But the more refined the individual, so that's what the, the gross or the dense mind thinks of its use, right? But the more refined individual starts thinking in the refined or purified state of gold, it becomes like the colloidal gold, which is colloidals are made by putting, uh, putting an arc through... Uh, um, to put, putting an arc through water as a birthing pool and then spitting out small ions of it that are ingestible, right? So all what this has to do, this harmony, is about being refined and purified so that way you can connect with other elements without contaminating them. That's really what you're looking at here in the refinement and the purification of self. So this, the gross and the dense person then thinks of gold only as, again, uh, uh, for their physicality, while the more ethereal person, the refined person in their consciousness is thinking of it in a monatomic or uh, colloidal level. Same thing with silver. Someone may create uh, uh, some kind of silver vase or something of that nature and say, oh, silver has a very lustrous, shiny look. I like it. And this is like the whole golem personality. I like the color of silver and they shine it and then they put it on the counter in the room and then they look at it and then, you know, a couple weeks later, they're not even thinking about it anymore. But this is the only physical understanding of the silver. Not, hey, why don't we just melt this cup down, make it into two rods, then create a wave current that turns it in, turns this into colloidal silver. Then we can apply it to our body and start killing killing the bacteria that's within our body uh, 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 and start making that transition into a higher spin. Now, the term that I use, again, is high spin because through lifetimes, okay, through lifetimes, you go through these degrees and you may start out here on the nine degree <laughs> and as your lifetimes go, you start spiraling back in to yourself, right? Centripedal or centrifugal, though. Some people are spiraling out. They're getting more polarized. They're coming out into these other zones and adding other things, but the more grosser explanation and interpretation of it, and this is what I've noticed is happening a lot in the spiritual world now, is that people's interpretation of what an extraterrestrial is, what a UFO may be, what a, a cross means, what an archon is, all of these kind of uh, uh, explanations are generally gross and dense. So the visualization that the individual gets from that will not allow them to go into centering themselves. It only will allow them to polarize themselves further. Oh, I hate them, right? So if you hate fire, what do you become? Water. But water is seeking to get to fire. Many of these degrees lower down, uh, fire is seeking to get to water. Many of these degrees down here are making their transition or warring with these elements down here. So, but through these mediaries, and this is another thing that you need to under, understand about mediaries. Fire and water are the two opposite poles. Fire is never going to become water. Water is never going to become fire unless they make the transition to earth or air. And this is very important because you need to ask yourself, are we as human beings now acting or reacting into the show where we're playing the mediaries between two polarized subjects or topics, uh, standards in a tense? And let me go into this. 
this chessboard. Because there's two things or three things you should see on the chessboard become important and connect with what we're talking about. And that is that on a chessboard, let's just draw it from this side, right? And you have the pieces here, right? And then the pieces here, I guess, rudimentary chessboard, right? Right? And then you have the black ones, obviously, and then you have the white ones, and then you have the rest of the spectrum in between, right? So this is, let's say this is white, okay? And this is black, right? But these are colors, <laughs> okay? And only clear is the absence of color, right? But they'll tell you, well, black is the absence of color, white is the absence of color. No, they, only clear is the absence of color. Black and white are their own colors. But what is in between here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? So you have these other colors that when white is on this side and it pushes into the adjacent color, which, you know, ultraviolet and higher ultraviolet, then eventually gets into white, then you have red, far infrared, finally gets into black, and then you have their expressions. So this is moving the pieces across the board. <laughs> okay, go to war, right? And then so they send out the expressions. And this is to hold the line, meaning that these two go back and forth with these wars to maintain the center of the board. <laughs> But what you have to realize is the hidden hand. <laughs> and that's every bit of a hand. It's the person who is, or being, who is moving the pieces. You never know what kind of finger it may be. But the hand of whoever is moving these pieces is what we need to understand. Sometimes we get into the queen, <laughs> or the black queen, or the white queen, or the black king, or the black bishop, or the white pope. You see what I mean? So we get into all these different dynamics on the board. <laughs> Meanwhile, our lives are being wasted away. We are on time, and this is why time is connected with these three things. Okay? And then it gets into dense and it gets into non-conductivity, right? And it gets into bones, okay? And this is the entire Saturnalian principle because Saturnalian, the metal of Saturn, is lead. So lead does not, it does not become affected by light. It actually affects light. So this is big news to these light workers when they're thinking they're going to get rid of these Saturnalians when they need to focus on just what they're doing with their own personal alchemy and then take the, uh, the great glass elevator and climb the spine and go into the other dimensions that have less uh, uh, gross impurities. That's what you should be focusing on. But if you're dealing with old lead head, meaning that if you're trying to change the Saturnalian principle, take lead and then attempt to send a frequency through it. It deadens it out. In fact, if you put a lead dome over something, it, there's no reception because the signals can't get in. What does this say? This means that Saturn, the Saturnalian principle is what remains after everything is gone. Everything is, is, is pushed itself into the wrong direction and then made itself decay. And then it becomes lead. This is when if you stay into your metallic states, I'm gold, I'm silver, you stay into these states, you'll find that all these metals transcend themselves eventually into gold after their fanfare, meaning after they run out of all the energy and then they start becoming corrosive and then non-conductive, then they start to actually become lead. That's what makes a Saturnalian. And then there is no feelings because there's no frequency, right? And so these principles and laws, this is universal law, it interprets so many things about what we're experiencing in our reality, but it also lets us know personally what we may be doing that is going to have no effect and is going to be wasting our time, right? So understand that there's more than just lead, there's tin, and as this new uh, quest begins, we'll start going through all of the elements in this kind of information so that way it becomes crystal clear to everyone here what exactly is going on.